Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel. Today I want to take a look at one of the many systems that sit behind me. A lot of these back here are in sort of unknown working order and it's about time we take a look at the Amiga 1000. So let's bring it down and see what's going on. Right, so this is it, the Amiga 1000. I picked this machine up a couple of years ago off eBay and I'm pretty sure it was sold as untested, which means it probably does not work. But before we go trying to power this thing on, I do want to pull it apart just to check out the power supply and see what else is going on inside here. And to be honest, I'm no expert on Amigas. So if I say something silly, feel free to correct me in the comments. Just uh, try and keep it polite. Um, let's, let's open this thing up, take a look inside. Oh, and you will notice on the front here, there is this oddness. I don't know what that means. Does the OS get to load from RAM or ROM? Is this like a filter of some kind? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that is not standard. Although it does look pretty neat. Let's see. Uh, actually, it appears that all the screws have already been taken out. I think these look like the screw holes, so and there is something. The front cover just came off. This does have a RAM expansion there. Um, and there is something shaking around inside as well. That's pretty cool. So yes, the Amiga 1000 has like all the signatures from people who worked on the machine. Something you don't really see these days. Usually they just put up a net for the people that worked hard. And here's some screws. Um, well, at least I know the screws are somewhere. So nice of whoever took the screws out to bag them all up, I guess. Been better if they put them all back in, but okay. This looks just like an RF shield. Okay, inside we have a couple of switches. I assume these are what are supposed to go out the front there. Uh, there is a random little board here with a couple of 74 logic on it. There's some bodges. I don't know like which bodges are factory, if any, or which aren't. I guess we'll figure that out as we go. Uh, the power supply is the first thing I want to look at. So let's try and get that out. Done. Okay, the one thing that does still have screws. I need to take this rear port cover thing off. Again, no screws, so might be able to just Well, at least we can clean that up at some point. Alrighty, the power supply. Let's, let's just keep tearing stuff down. I assume this RAM expansion slides out. Okay. This front face, there is a screw. There is still a screw at least. Oh yes. should just unplug. Oh no, that is, might be connected directly to the board. Maybe it doesn't unplug. Maybe not. I can pop it out from this side though. Okay, whoop, drive LED. 
Right. Face off. Maybe a screw on holding it on the underside. No. Ah, but I can see it's kind of hooked into the case there. So, should sort of tilt up. Oh, I don't want to take the whole board out just yet. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, there's little stickers that are falling out. First even, second even, 34, 5, plus Guardian. Let's take a proper look at this power supply. It doesn't appear to be too dusty. Obviously, there's a bit of dust in the fan, but not too bad. Uh, it is an SR680550M. I have no idea how many different power supplies there are for the Mega 1000, but that's what this one is. Now, it looks like these screws should come out. I'm thinking that it's just gonna sort of slide open somehow. Yes, it is. Sweet. All right. Inside we have big fat reefer capacitor up the top there. Yeah, so it is a 0.47 microfarad X2 class and there is a little bit of what looks like cracking around there. So definitely want to get that out. Oh yes. And Looking at the front of it, it's going to be hard to see that on the camera, but yeah, there is some what looks like hairline fractures. So yes, that capacitor should definitely come out. Uh, I'm not sure if I've got something to replace it with on hand, but uh, we can run the machine without that capacitor and it should be fine. Uh, the line filter capacitors are just for filtering out any noise on the actual power lines, be it coming out of this machine or out of the switch mode power supply or coming into the machine from other noisy power supplies. So that should be fine to pull it out and run this machine without it. And we'll take a closer look at some of these electrolytics just to make sure they seem okay as well. So now I've got to pull the rest of this thing apart. All right. Power board's finally out. There is a bit of this orange dust everywhere, but uh, nothing too sinister looking, apart from, of course, yes, the reefer. And yeah, the Y-class ones are also got hints of like hairline fractures through them. Camera's not gonna focus. Yeah. So yes, these three will come out for sure. Apart from that, everything looks okay. There is what appears to just be glue along the outside here, so I'm not worried about that. Unless, of course, it becomes conductive and then turns brown and shorts things out. But for now, I'm not concerned about that. The main concern is getting these things out and uh, go from there, I guess. simply just going to heat up one leg and just sort of tilt it to the side, work it out. One. Two. And three. All right, what I'm gonna do is give this a clean. Uh, there's not much to be really cleaned up on the main board, but I will clean up the case a little bit. And obviously this fan, which is 
gross. So, um, I'll clean things up and we'll come back and, I guess, try and power this thing on. Alright, so I'm pretty sure I've got my microphone switched on this time, so let's carry on. So uh, these are the reefer caps that came out and they look okay at the moment, but if we tilt them on an angle, yeah, you can really see how um, bad they're looking. So yeah, I, even the Y class ones don't look that great if the camera will focus. So um, yeah, I'm gonna leave all of these out for now because I don't actually have uh, replacements to put in, but I'll order some. Uh, the machine should be fine without it, as I said. Uh, but I do want to at least replace them at some point. So the other thing I noticed while I had this power supply out was this black area, uh, which is pretty much underneath this capacitor here. Um, I don't think it's actually related to the capacitor, but I'm going to pop that one out just to um, check it out of circuit because yeah, I don't like the look of that. There is sort of a, you can almost see like a, a circle around approximately where it is but that doesn't actually line up correctly with the capacitor itself so I'm not sure why that sort of circle is there. It feels fairly flat but anyway let's pop this capacitor out here and just test it out of circuit. So yeah, you can see all that glue that was around the base just holding it onto the board uh, so I'll clean all that off. It, uh, it's really not required for something like this that uh, isn't going to be, you know, shipped any long distances anytime soon. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to hold on to this machine as long as possible. Mm, and yeah, looking under that capacitor, look at that. So that lines up with this leg here. So yeah, maybe it has leaked out or maybe that glue uh, is causing some issues. It's a 470 microfarad 35 volts. So let's just test it with the meter. See what it says. Uh, I'll just switch it over to 120 hertz because uh, that's sort of the standard for testing all capacitors. Even though I think this capacitor is in the secondary side of the circuit. So it's probably working at a much higher frequency, but uh, 387 microfarads. Uh, with a D value of 0.06. It's definitely at the very bottom end of the 20% tolerance. Let's bump up the frequency. 358 microfarads. And yeah, 10 kilohertz, it's not even reading anything. Obviously 100 kilohertz is not gonna get us anywhere. So yeah, I think this should be replaced either way. And obviously I'll clean up the board here. Well, let's just see if IPA has any effect. Yeah, yeah. But I do definitely need to sort of find something like a flat plastic blade to scrape off that glue. Maybe this. I'm sure the camera is probably picking up the dogs barking outside at the moment. They like to do that when I'm filming. You go with something a little bit harder and just go a flat blade screwdriver. Scratch up the board a little bit at least. As long as I get rid of the bulk of this glue, I'm okay with a couple of scratches to the power board. Don't think anyone is going to be too upset by that. All right. I think that'll do for the top side. Let's check the underside. And yeah, this is a big old mess here. Well, it still looks kind of black, but I'm thinking that it should be okay. Yeah, there's no short between these two parts, so... There's probably some other components, because we're getting about 6 mega ohms, but yeah, there's... 
I think that should be okay. Now to find a replacement cap. Uh, 47035. Right, well that sucks. I don't have anything to replace it with. Uh, just trying to look up the data sheet. I couldn't find one for the Chemicon SXA. That's what this little logo is. And the SXA is the series. I did find SXC and SXE listed in their data sheets and uh, the characteristics of those are both low impedance. So I'm assuming this is gonna be a low impedance capacitor and that means I have to replace it with something that's low impedance, but at the moment I don't have one on hand. So um, we're just gonna stick this back in and hope that it still is somewhat good. Um, so yes, add that to the list of uh, capacitors that I need to get. Right, so our capacitor that may fail completely soon is back in, and I also added some solder back to these uh, exposed traces here to thicken them back up. So um, yeah, that's gonna remain a mystery for now, but I'm just gonna put a cross on it just so I know that I will be replacing it. <laughs> All right, let's take our focus off the power supply for now. So also while I had the microphone disconnected, I did pull apart the whole case and give everything a good scrub in some warm soapy water. So there were a lot of brown spots everywhere. Uh, the only thing I haven't done is the keyboard, haven't touched that yet. But as for the rest of the case, it's about as clean as I can get it right now. We'll take a look at the main board in a second, but yeah, here's the rear cover. So. Definitely not as brown in those vents, but there's still, I don't know if it's just yellowing. It's sort of, it's very uneven in spots. So I, I, yeah, I can't say that it's yellowed or maybe a combination of yellow and just some kind of dirt that I can't get out. But yeah, this top corner back here, like looks pretty nasty as well. But apart from that, the actual case itself looks great. RF shields, I didn't bother doing anything with them, but I'll reinstall them. And uh, yeah, I also cleaned out the rear fan here, which is, yeah, it's a, it's a mains powered fan. So it's actually quite heavy. And a little floppy disk drive again, I haven't opened this up yet. So we'll see what's going on here. The rear of it looks okay. I'm not seeing any uh, obvious issues. Motor spins, seems fine. And yeah, bottom of the case, definitely a lot cleaner than before, but yeah, not perfect, unfortunately. Now, the main board. So yes, these little labels appear to be off some ROM chips, which are no longer installed in the machine. There was a version of the Kickstart ROMs that had a thing called Guardian. It's basically like an uh, antivirus kind of thing built into the ROMs. So I'm guessing that's what these had on them because they say 34.5 plus Guardian. But either way, um, the original ROMs are actually missing. So yes, the board actually has odd and even diagnostic ROMs. So uh, there's no Kickstarter or Kickboot ROMs in here even. So um, yeah, I guess we'll try and power it up with the diagnostic ROMs in there. Maybe it'll tell us something. Uh, but yes, this little red wire here has also broken off somewhere. And I think it's down on this IC down here. You can see this green wire has a lot of cable and it's only loosely holding on. So that could easily short out to something. So I think the best bet here is just to remove this little modification entirely for now. Uh, I can always come back and reinstall it, but I think it's the best idea to remove. And yeah, the other part, uh, which goes to the filter switch, I believe is a switch to disable the seven kilohertz filter on the Amiga 1000. So these machines apparently had uh, a hardwired filter to filter out all the frequencies and the sound above seven kilohertz. Um, and on the Amiga 500 and onwards, it's switchable in software, but apparently on the Amiga 1000, it was hardwired. So that's kind of where these switches and I guess some of this logic comes in. The rest of it does appear to relate to perhaps somebody installing a uh, built-in kickstart ROM. 
Uh, so yeah, for now, I'm just gonna remove all this stuff because yeah, it's, it's gonna easily short out to something and we don't need it right now. So we can always reinstall it later. Right, so it actually turns out our little green wire here is connecting directly to the board where that pin would have gone, but that's been cut off. Um, but you can see just how much lead is left and it could easily short to say this little resistor, or is it a capacitor? Little axial capacitor there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty dodge, but I've reconnected the red wire. I think we should just power this on and see what happens. In fact, what I'm gonna do is stick a little bit of heat shrink over this just to prevent it hopefully from shorting out to something. It's probably a better idea. Just gonna quickly check these voltage rails, make sure nothing is shorted on this side. Everything looks fine. It all just looks to be charging up various capacitors. All right, cool. Let's power this thing on and see what happens. Now I'm not gonna hook up a monitor or put all the screws back in just yet, just enough to ensure that there's a ground connection between the major components. Um, yeah, we'll just see if these power and drive lights come on and if the machine does anything at all, if something explodes, who knows. Well, the fan has come on, the power LED has come on, nothing smoking. Cool, let's hook up a monitor, see if it's doing anything at all. All right, it's just my little makeshift monitor, for perfect for testing these kind of things. So we've got a black screen. Just gonna connect the keyboard, see if that makes any difference. Nothing happening. I think I should burn some kick boot ROMs, see if that does anything. In fact, maybe I should check these switches. Let's switch both these switches the other way, see if that does anything. No, just PAL and nothing. All right, so after a quick look online, I found the original kick boot ROMs or bootstrap ROMs or boot ROMs, whatever you want to call them. And I've burnt them to some EPROMs here. So let's stick these in, see if it makes any difference. The pins look like they're all in, haven't bent under anywhere. So um, that should be it. I don't know if these jumpers are set correctly because I think that is also part of the modification when you try and actually put the whole kickstart image into ROM. So uh, I guess we'll find out about that at some point. But um, yeah, that's reassembled. I'm just gonna kind of sit that on the, up there so it doesn't short to anything. No idea if the switches are right, but uh, let's power it on with the what should be the original ROMs. And we still have a black screen. Hmm. Could it be those jumpers? Could it be these switches? Could it be this mess of a mod in general? It's hard to really know. Could it be something completely unrelated to all that? Let's just take a real quick look at some voltages, see if that provides any clues. So this pin here is 2.9 volts. Uh, they should be five, that seems right. This one is 12 volts and the final one is minus five. So yeah, that three volt pin, which is the gray wire, it, could be wrong, could be right, but the rest of them look to be what you'd expect from this system. But yeah, 
nothing going on, just a black screen. I wonder if swapping these jumpers over will do anything. The power LED is definitely coming on. The drive doesn't seem to be doing anything, but I don't know if that's, I don't know if the drive does anything until it actually manages to boot and then ask for the, the kickstart disc. Um, again, I just don't know enough about Amigas to really know where to go next. So, um, I'd have to end the video here. So if you know or have any idea about the Amiga 1000 and what I should look at next, uh, I guess I could start looking at clock signals, but if you've got any ideas, put them in the comment section down below. Again, if you know anything about this mod, um, or the, the jumpers, basically throw your knowledge of Amiga 1000s at me, if you don't mind. Um, otherwise, if you don't know anything, um, leave a comment, let me know if you enjoyed the video. A massive thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon and YouTube memberships. And uh, if you want to support the channel, links to that are down below. But as always, thanks for watching the Retro Channel, and I will catch you in the next one where we will hopefully get something more than a black screen out of this machine. Thanks for watching. Bye.